Inventors are often viewed as eccentric individuals, locked away in secret labs, producing huge numbers of wacky and often useless prototypes, before finally making it big with a world-changing creation. While some inventors certainly do go on to change the world and obtain fame and fortune, for many inventors throughout history, their creations have been the very thing which ended their lives. Here are my choices for five inventors who were killed by their inventions. Number 5. Franz Reichelt Also known as the Flying Tailor, Franz Reichelt was an Austrian-born tailor and inventor who moved to Paris and became obsessed with the idea of creating a suit for pilots which doubled as a functioning parachute that would allow them to escape a crashing aircraft unscathed. During his lifetime he had witnessed the birth of powered flight in 1903, however this new invention was still in its infancy and therefore tended to be unreliable, with aviators unlikely to survive any accidents. These accidents had led to a growing interest in safety measures, and there was a huge demand for the creation of a practical parachute. Early attempts at parachuting had utilised fixed canopy designs which were already open prior to jumping, however such a design was simply not practical for use inside the tight confines of an aircraft cockpit, and a solution that was suitable for use when jumping from a plane at low altitudes was still lacking. Fame and fortune awaited anyone who would come up with a suitable design, and in 1911 a prize of 10,000 francs was offered to anyone who could create a parachute for aviators. It was against this background that Reichelt had begun working on a parachute suit, which was a suit that was supposedly similar in size and bulk to a standard suit normally worn by aviators. The suit contained a few rods, some rubber, and a silk canopy, which would fold out to hopefully become a usable parachute. Early testing with dummies, using the silk wings, had proved successful, however converting this design into a wearable suit proved troublesome, and further experiments would result in test dummies crashing to the ground. Reichelt blamed the failures on using a test platform that was not high enough, and subsequently applied for permission to conduct a test from the Eiffel Tower. He was finally granted permission to conduct a test using dummies on February 4th, 1912, and announced to the press that he would finally prove the worth of his invention. He arrived at the tower already wearing the suit, and incredibly it seemed as though he was intent on testing it himself instead of using dummies. His friends desperately tried to change his mind, pointing to high winds as a reason to abandon his test, however Reichelt was unswayable. In a further twist he refused to use any safety measures, and in full view of spectators and journalists armed with cameras, he climbed to 187 feet and prepared to jump. He mounted a stool on top of a table and placed one foot on the guardrail. He hesitated for about 40 seconds, perhaps reconsidering his risky jump, before leaping over. As he plummeted towards the ground, his parachute failed to open fully and Reichelt crashed into the frozen earth at the feet of the tower, dying instantly and in full view of the multiple cameras pointed at him. His death was reported all around the world where he was portrayed as a mad genius or simply mad, but why had he taken such an unnecessary risk? One of his friends later commented that he had felt pressured into giving a dramatic demonstration, so as to attract media coverage and sponsors, whom he would need the backing of in order to profit from the suit before its patent expired. Additionally, other inventors were already making their own tests with parachutes, and it's likely that he felt that time was running out. Number 4. Thomas Midgley Jr. A brilliant mechanical engineer and chemist, Thomas Midgley was granted over 100 patents over the course of his career, and some of his most notable and infamous work involved the invention of leaded gasoline and CFC gases used in aerosols and refrigerators. He was a key member of the team which created leaded gasoline as a solution to the problem of engine knocking, which was a shock wave caused by small pockets of air inside a car's engine, which could cause extensive damage. A natural solution to this problem already existed, whereby ethanol was added to the gasoline, however this process could not be patented and was therefore not as profitable as an artificial solution. General Motors promoted their leaded product as a superior alternative to ethanol, as it was patented and therefore extremely profitable. The downside to the leaded gasoline was that it was extremely toxic, and public concern was raised following several deaths caused by lead poisoning. In an attempt to calm the public's fears, Midgley took part in a press conference on October 30th, 1924, in which he poured the lead over his hands and then inhaled its vapour from a bottle continuously for 60 seconds. He told the gathered observers that he could do this every day without experiencing any problems, however this demonstration failed to do its job. Midgley would suffer lead poisoning as a result of this demonstration and was forced to take an extended leave of absence from work while he recovered. This was not the cause of his death, however. In 1940, he contracted polio, 
and was left severely disabled. Unable to move himself out of bed, he put his inventive mind to the problem, coming up with a system of strings and pulleys, which would aid in lifting him from his bed each day. In a strange twist to the tale, it was this last invention which would kill him, as in a freak accident he became entangled in the ropes, which made up the device, dying as a result of strangulation aged 55. His legacy has since become largely negative and highly controversial. His work on leaded gasoline led to large levels of lead being released into the atmosphere, which has been linked with long-term health issues in millions of people, and his work on CFCs has been linked with ozone depletion in the upper atmosphere. Number 3. Horace Lawson Hunley With the American Civil War raging, the Confederate Marine engineer Horace Lawson Hunley found himself with the skills needed to obtain fame and fortune, as well as to make an invaluable contribution to the South's war effort. In 1861, he set to work with two friends in attempting to build a functioning hand-powered submarine. A large bounty was being offered by the Confederate government for the sinking of Union ships, and of course, should the design prove successful, huge sums of money were up for the taking in mass-producing the design. The three men set to work on their first design, the Pioneer, however had to scuttle her when New Orleans fell to Union forces in 1862. Undeterred, they began work on a second version, the American Diver, however this also failed and ended up sinking in Mobile Bay, Alabama during a fierce storm. Still persevering, Hunley self-funded the creation of a third submarine, named after himself, the H.L. Hunley. The 40-foot-long submarine was just 4 feet 3 inches high and was designed for a crew of eight, with seven men turning the hand-cranked propeller and one steering the sub. The completed vessel was transported to Charleston, South Carolina in 1863, where it was seized by the Confederate Army and given a new crew. Yet disaster struck when the Hunley sank during a test run after its new captain accidentally stepped on a lever, which caused the sub to dive while the hatches were still open. Five of the eight crewmen drowned in the accident, as Hunley observed in horror from the shore. The valuable sub was salvaged, and on October 15, 1863, Hunley decided to take command of the vessel during a mock attack exercise. Exactly what happened underwater is unknown, However, the Hunley failed to surface, and all eight crew were killed, including Horace Hunley, as a result of either cold or asphyxiation. The Hunley had now sunk twice, killing 13 crew, including its creator, but this was not the end of the submarine's story. She was later salvaged once more, and in 1864, was used in the first successful sinking of an enemy vessel by a submarine in naval history. Yet minutes after the attack, perhaps as a result of damage received during the attack, the Hunley once again sank for the third time, killing all eight crew, bringing the total number of lives lost on board the Hunley to 21. Number 2. Henry Smolinski Ever since the car and plane have been around, inventors have dreamed about combining the two. As cars have become more widely adopted, they have brought with them congestion and traffic jams. A car that's able to take off and escape the gridlock seems like the perfect solution, and if such a machine could be created, surely riches and fame await its creator. It was with such a dream that Henry Smolinski started a company with the aim of fusing plane and car. He created a prototype called the Mizar, which was made by using the rear part of a Cessna Skymaster fused onto a Ford Pinto, although later models were planned to have a purpose-built airframe. The driver's controls were adapted so that the owner could fly the plane using the steering wheel, turning left or right to turn, and pulling or pushing to ascend or descend. The rudder was controlled by pedals, and the dashboard was fitted with all the necessary flight instruments. The machine was designed to fly at 12,000 feet at 130 miles per hour, and would have a range of at least 1,000 miles, and was planned to go on sale for somewhere in the region of $18,000 to $29,000. And while it might look too large to run on roads, it was designed so that after landing, the airframe could be tied down and unbolted from the Pinto, which would then be free to drive off on public highways. By 1973, two prototypes had been built, with three more under construction. Authorization to conduct test flights was finally given, and on August 26, 1973, the hybrid vehicle took to the skies. Unfortunately, it soon encountered problems, and according to the test pilot, the right wing came unattached, forcing him to ditch the craft in a nearby field. The downed Mizar was otherwise undamaged by the ordeal, and taken back to the airport for examination. Undeterred by this failure, test flights continued, and on September 11, 1973, Henry Smolinski was flying his creation when once again the right wing detached from the Pinto. This time, however, the outcome would prove deadly. The right wing folded and the Mizar crashed to the ground in a fiery wreck, 
instantly killing Henry Smolinski and his associate Harold Blake. A later investigation into the crash revealed that the Pinto was simply too heavy for the airframe. Even without passengers or fuel, it was already over the weight limit, which coupled with poor design, loose parts and bad welding, led to the wing becoming detached and the plane crashing to the ground. The tragic death of Henry Smolinski spelled the end for the Mizar project and his company was subsequently shut down permanently. Number 1. Valerian Abakovsky Between 1917 and 1922, the Russian civil war between the Bolsheviks and anti-communists was devastating Russia. Although the Red Army had made breakthroughs, their losses were mounting, and against this backdrop, they were understandably keen to obtain any new technologies that might give them a combat advantage. It's here that a young inventor named Valerian Abakovsky enters the history books. The Latvian-born inventor usually made his living as a chauffeur for the Cheka, which was the first Soviet state security organization. While working in this position, he would have had access to high-ranking officials, so it's likely that he was able to gain the ear of someone in power with talk of his latest invention, the Aerowagon. The Aerowagon was a high-speed rail car fitted with an aircraft engine and propeller and was designed to transport high-ranking officials far quicker than an ordinary train. Such an advantage might give the Red Army an edge in the war, as important officials could reach their destinations in record time and the technology might even be rolled out to ferry troops to the front line far quicker than before. It seems as though the young chauffeur's lack of experience in creating inventions manifested itself in the aerowagon's design however, and according to witnesses it was extremely loud and appeared somewhat unstable. The railcar contained a massive aircraft propeller at its front, and there were immediate concerns over the machine's safety. Despite these fears, the aerowagon was given its chance to impress on July the 24th, 1921, a group of high-ranking Bolshevik officials decided to try the rail car out on a return trip from Moscow to Tula, inviting several foreign communist sympathizers on board with them to marvel at this new invention. The first leg of the trip went smoothly, and it seemed as if Abakovsky might soon be leaving behind his former life as a chauffeur. However, on the return trip, the aerowagon violently derailed at high speed, crashing into the surrounding countryside and killing six of the 22 passengers, including its creator, Valerian Abakovsky. The six dead men were buried in the Kremlin Wall necropolis, and although the aero wagon was deemed to be a failure, it's regarded as the inspiration for several other experimental designs combining the railcar with the aircraft, including the German Scheinen Zeppelin railcar, the American M497 Black Beetle railcar, and the Soviet turbojet train. So those are my choices for five inventors who were killed by their creations. Let me know which other examples you know of in the comments below, and I'll see you again on the next video. He was intent on testing it himself instead of using dummies. His friends desperately tried to change his mind, pointing to high winds as a reason to abandon his test. However, Reichelt was unswayable. In a further twist, he refused to use any safety measures, and in full view of spectators and journalists armed with cameras, he climbed to 187 feet and prepared to jump. He mounted a stall on top of a table and placed one foot on the guardrail. He hesitated for about 40 seconds, perhaps reconsidering his risky jump, before leaping over. As he plummeted towards the ground, his parachute failed to open fully and Reichelt crashed into the frozen earth at the feet of the tower, dying instantly and in full view of the multiple cameras pointed at him. His death was reported all around the world where he was Inventors are often viewed as eccentric individuals, locked away in secret labs, producing huge numbers of wacky and often useless prototypes, before finally making it big with a world-changing creation. While some inventors certainly do go on to change the world and obtain fame and fortune, for many inventors throughout history, their creations have been the very thing which ended their lives. Here are my choices for five inventors who were killed by their inventions. Number 5. Franz Reichelt also known as the Flying Tailor, Franz Reichelt was an Austrian-born tailor and inventor who moved to Paris and became obsessed with the idea of creating a suit for pilots which doubled as a functioning parachute that would allow them to escape a crashing aircraft unscathed. During his lifetime he had witnessed the birth of Powered Suit, which was a suit that was supposedly similar in size and bulk to a standard suit normally worn by aviators. The suit contained a few rods, some rubber and a silk canopy, which would fold out to hopefully become a usable parachute. Early testing with dummies using the silk wings had proved successful, however converting this design into a wearable suit proved troublesome, and further experiments would result in test dummies crashing to the ground. 
Reichelt blamed the failures on using a test platform that was not high enough and subsequently applied for permission to conduct a test from the Eiffel Tower. He was finally granted permission to conduct a test using dummies on February the 4th, 1912 and announced to the press that he would finally prove the worth of his invention. He arrived at the tower already wearing the suit and incredibly it seemed as though he flight in 1903. However, this new invention was still in its infancy and therefore tended to be unreliable, with aviators unlikely to survive any accidents. These accidents had led to a growing interest in safety measures and there was a huge demand for the creation of a practical parachute. Early attempts at parachuting had utilized fixed canopy designs which were already open prior to jumping. However, such a design was simply not practical for use inside the tight confines of an aircraft cockpit and a solution that was suitable for use when jumping from a plane at low altitudes was still lacking. Fame and fortune awaited anyone who would come up with a suitable design, and in 1911 a prize of 10,000 francs was offered to anyone who could create a parachute for aviators. It was against this background that Reichelt had begun working on a parachute portrayed as a mad genius or simply mad. But why had he taken such an unnecessary risk? One of his friends later commented that he had felt pressured into giving a dramatic demonstration so as to attract media coverage and sponsors whom he would need the backing of in order to profit from the suit before its patent expired. Additionally, other inventors were already making their own tests with parachutes and it's likely that he felt that time was running out. Number 4. Thomas Midgley Jr. A brilliant mechanical engineer and chemist, Thomas Midgley was granted over 100 patents over the course of his career and some of his most notable and infamous work involved the invention of leaded gasoline and CFC gases used in aerosols and refrigerators. He was a key member of the team which created leaded gasoline as a solution 